Thanks a lot for the opportunity to share this experience with you. The presentation, while I'll really be really focusing on the CADEP experience, I wanted to put it in context more broadly of the Main Street Nutrition Agricultural Investment Plan, because whether it's CADEP or not CADEP, most countries have an agricultural investment plan, and um, I'd like to speak a little bit why it's a strategic entry point for the nutrition agenda, uh, but what are some of the challenges associated with that and, and some of the opportunities we can use. I'll start going through the slides. I'll start with a few slides on setting the scene, on why uh, these agricultural investments are so key, um, what does it mean to mainstream nutrition in an agriculture program, um, and what are opportunities and challenges uh, that we, we have at, at hand presently for that agenda. I'll build then on the example of the CADEP uh, nutrition capacity development process uh, as an example, and conclude with uh, looking forward and, and, and highlighting some of the challenges, opportunities, and milestones that, that we have. So, what are some of the key issues? Maybe it seems obvious to some of us, um, but um, we have to constantly remind a lot of people, especially those working in agriculture and food systems, that uh, they have an absolutely central uh, role in making sustainable improvements to nutrition. We, we all know we can't fix non-nutrition problems with a, a few quick fixes. Um, we also have to sometimes to remind the, the health uh, colleagues that uh, food and agricultural systems can bring a lot, but we need to explain a little bit more in detail how they function and what they can bring concretely. At a practical level, uh, many countries have multi-sectoral nutrition strategies with agricultural activities, but if you then look at the sectoral budget, and, and to, you know most governments do plan sectorally their, their budgets, these nutrition activities are not necessarily captured in the agriculture side. Um, and if they're not, they might be in the multi-sectoral nutrition strategy, they're not going to be implemented. Um, finally, there are hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars invested in agriculture, both in the public sector and the private sector. Um, how can we leverage those to improve nutrition? We, we may have a massive opportunity here that we're not seizing. And even in some cases, some of these agricultural investments might be leading to uh, harmful evolutions in terms of diets and, and uh, ecosystems. Concretely, what does it mean to mainstream nutrition in agriculture? Um, uh, we've been involved in uh, facilitating a process of capitalizing on lessons learned and reviewing all recently published guidance on mainstream nutrition in agriculture programs uh, in the last two years, working essentially through the Act to Nutrition Committee of Practice. And I say we, uh, the process was facilitated by SAO, in particular a consultant, Anna Herforth, but really engaging a very broad uh, number of stakeholders and over 70 experts. And we boiled down key recommendations to 10 points uh, for programs. And, and they're here on this slide. I'll go through them very uh, briefly. But the first thing is really to incorporate explicit nutrition objectives and indicators in the design of programs. We can't just assume that agriculture will automatically have an impact, or at least a positive impact, on nutrition. And we should also be tracking and mitigating potential harms. Um, this can only be done if we really assess the context of the local level to address the different types of malnutrition, whether it's micronutrient deficiencies, overnutrition, undernutrition, um, and see how they relate to diets and, and what are the causes. There is no magic bullet. There is no one size fits all. So that's why that context specificity is so key. Targeting the most vulnerable and equity issues are key to making nutrition, uh, agriculture work for nutrition. Collaboration with other sectors. Um, thinking of the sustainability and therefore the natural resource management is absolutely central. Uh, working with and supporting and empowering women. Um, at the, in terms of activities, uh, it's very much about facilitating the diversification of production, uh, increasing the production of nutrient-dense crops, and also other uh, areas of agriculture, such as small-scale livestock, fisheries, and so on. A lot can be done on processing, storage, and preservation, especially as most consumers are now increasingly relying on markets and um, processed foods, especially in urban areas looking at how we can strengthen the engagement of more vulnerable groups in markets. So expanding market access to these vulnerable groups, sorry, both as a source of income, but also as a means of accessing nutritious 
um, an affordable or a rather affordable nutrient rich food. And finally, a nutrition education should be central to helping consumers take the decisions they, they can take to use the resources they have, income and food, in an optimal way for their nutritional status. So these are some of those the key points that we're uh, hammering down as a, as a core message. Now, what are the challenges that we're facing in, in, in having these taken on and, and being put into practice? There is still a limited ownership of nutrition by agriculture. Um, so very much, oh, that's the business of health. Or on the contrary, of course I work for nutrition and improving production and income, but failing to really see the pathway between that increased production and income and food consumption and ultimately nutritional status. And vice versa, um, though it's changing slowly, a lot of public health nutritionists don't really understand how the food and agricultural sector works and sometimes you know that makes the dialogue dif difficult. Um, the coordination mechanisms at global, regional and country levels are often still slightly separate with nutrition largely in health-based coordination and um, food security and agriculture being in a different group. So the dialogue and the linkages are difficult. Um, there's a limited understanding amongst everybody of concretely how agriculture can improve nutrition, which is where the 10 points of this show came in. A temptation to use more quick fixes. Um, there's a temptation often to ask, where's the Lancet series for agriculture? Give us the top 10 uh, agriculture interventions for nutrition. And well, the thing is, we tend to say, it depends. Are you in a pastoralist context or you're in an urban area? Um, it won't be the same response, and that context specificity and the systemic approach we need to use is sometimes a message that's difficult to, to pass through. Um, huge capacity constraints, and I'll build on that later. The question of what and how to monitor, what can agriculture be held accountable for, improving stunt, reducing stunting, improving diets. Um, what's the evidence base they can use to say, okay, I'll try this intervention because I'm more likely to have an impact there. Questions around the cost. Um, what does it mean to integrate nutrition and investment plan? What are the cost implications? What are the trade-offs as well between economic objectives of the plan and nutrition objectives? And finally, you know, we have these nice workshops and conferences and trainings, but how do we ensure follow-up? Um, we have an opportunity though, a big, big several opportunities. We have a growing number of countries putting nutrition at the top of their agenda as illustrated by the, number, the growing number of uh, sun countries. There are more and more multi-sectoral platforms being created or strengthened. But we're, what we're finding though in that nutrition momentum is that it's still been difficult to pull agriculture to the nutrition table, um, so to speak. On the other hand, another opportunity in the agricultural sector is that most, if not all, countries have an agricultural strategy and with it, hopefully, a budget, an investment plan. If you take the case of Africa, uh, 30 countries have signed their credit contacts and actually might have increased to 32 now, I think. Um, but again, in those plans, nutrition hardly appears. So this is uh, some of the um, elements we were taking into consideration when uh, designing and implementing the work that's been done on CADEP, and that's also taken into consideration in, in other uh, countries and regions of the world. So I'll, I'll zoom in on this CADEP example. I start by saying it's been uh, NEPAD-led, um, but with a very strong multi-stakeholder engagement. Uh, FAO was uh, the lead technical partner, um, helping especially with defining the, the content and supporting the, the institutional processes, but all this was really teamwork with uh, our sister UN agencies, USAID, the Gates Foundation, the European Union, German government, uh, Flemish uh, Development Fund, um, Harvest Plus, etc. Now, the objective was to enhance the nutritional impact of agricultural investments. That, that's the overall purpose of, of this process. And concretely, we were trying to see with countries how can they integrate nutrition in their CADEP process and investment plan. Um, the modality were uh, three sub regional workshops, and we can say they were interesting because they were a mix of a regional workshop where countries have a chance to learn from each other, but the country teams attending were big enough of between four to 11 or even 12 participants that you also had many country workshops within that 
uh, forum. We started with uh, West Africa in November 2011, uh, then went on to East and Central Africa in February of this year, and Southern Africa two or three weeks ago. And so over 45 countries have attended, and through these workshops, um, have developed a set of recommendations for improving the nutritional impact of their agriculture investment plans. Now, in defining the, the content and the process, we were really conscious that it can't be just about the workshop itself. Uh, we have to use this process so that we are strengthening momentum at country level and maximizing the chances of uptake um, for the follow-up. Now, that led to three uh, considerations. We really maximize the role of partnerships and coordination at the different levels. So at the regional level, in the way we were organizing, everything was run by a steering committee with all the partners I've mentioned above, plus members of civil society and academia. Um, we were ensuring uh, that the fund secretariat and, and reach facilitators were engaged in the process and ensuring linkages with the movement. Um, at the country level, uh, we were building multi-sectoral country teams and uh, engaging partners at, at various levels in terms of you know, funding participants' travel, proposing presentations, etc. In terms of the technical content um, of the workshop, we had a mixture of, and, and the methods, we had a mixture of plenary sessions of sharing experiences, both concepts and, and, and a lot, a lot of country examples and case studies. Alternating with mixed country group to facilitate exchange across countries and country group work. And in that country group work, the teams really did hands-on practical work. They basically went to their agricultural investment plan or cut it compact, or if they didn't have any, they went through the kind of rough planning process. And we, we I'll, I'll show you the roadmap in a while, but at the end, walking out with a very concrete set of recommendations. Um, and, and situation analysis and MNE were transversal because really always going back to the message, it has to be context specific and you have to be learning as you're doing. Country ownership and engagement was, was a key success factor. Um, so we had a very careful participant selection process. Um, we had a pre-workshop preparation and follow-up. And the key here, what I was talking about, is the difficulty of pulling um, agriculture to the nutrition table. Here we made it a nutrition table, an agriculture table. And it was deliberate that the invitations were passed on to the CADEP focal point. And the CADEP focal point are often directors of planning or sometimes the first secretary of agriculture. So quite high-level decision makers in agriculture, um, and by making them the convener of that of a workshop on nutrition, it was a it was a way of saying, okay, this is not about you participating in something external to you. This is about agriculture. This is for agriculture. This is by agriculture. And yes, we are talking about nutrition. Um, the workshops were also an opportunity to create a team spirit. Uh, and also the preparation and follow-up process, because often these people who were coming were not sitting in the same coordination methods in the country level. Here we were playing, creating a sort of a temporary uh, political space for discussions that may not be easy to have at country level to take place in a, in a neutral environment. And it was very interesting to see, to see those, those interactions uh, between people who sometimes were meeting for the first time. It's very rare, actually, for a director of planning and agriculture to get to speak to the nutrition officer of the Ministry of Health, unfortunately. Um, in agriculture, most of the time, nutrition is dealt with by often a woman who is alone uh, with a title like home economics at, you know, in the corner of an agricultural extension department. So there we were changing a bit the, the dynamics. This slide uh, presents the kind of uh, roadmap for the whole process. So we had a lot of country preparation, in particular by asking the countries to prepare what we call the nutrition country paper, where they summarized their nutrition situation and policy framework uh, and agreed on the, what are the key problems and what are issues to be tackled. We incidentally used the same format as the papers that the countries are being asked to prepare for the ICN2. Um, but this paper was a, a way of starting to, of getting the dialogue to start between participants even before they got 
to the workshop. For Southern Africa, we also basically had the participants create the agenda. We asked them to submit case studies they wish to present. And the process of selecting the case studies and of preparing those presentations was actually a great mobilization exercise. During the workshop, we started by setting the scene, putting everybody on the same uh, level because we had agriculturalists and nutritionists, education experts, some people from finance. So going through the basics, what is nutrition? What is cadet? Why are How does nutrition and agriculture fit? What are the main nutrition problems? Um, because that's actually a fundamental obstacle to dialogue, is, is not the ability the difficulty of speaking the same language. Then we, over the next four days, we rolled out the programming uh, cycle. So based on the nutrition problems discussed on the four days, first day, we then went into technical interventions with lots of case studies of what countries are doing now in the field, and we had parallel sessions and um, lots of exchange around those. Um, on uh, Wednesday, we also raised the question of uh, coordination. All of this we can only do in coordination within agriculture and with other sectors. Uh, then asking what information do we need for planning and for m and &E. uh, Thursday, we talked about what are the capacities that we need to do this. And finally, what are the costs? All the time, we were alternating between plenary sessions uh, with examples and then group work. And the countries walked out with a roadmap of recommendations of this is how we're going to better address nutrition. These are the kind of interventions we can do. These are the improvements, the coordination we should make. And also concrete action points. We're going to debrief next week in the Agricultural Development Partners meeting, or there will be a review of the CADEP next month. We have to prepare for that, et cetera. Um, so then the, the last part of the slide in red is what we hope to, to happen, but um, I'll go on to what is maybe possible and what is more difficult. Here are just two examples. Um, I'll let you browse through them rapidly, uh, of the examples of some of the recommendations that were coming out of the group work, so here in Ethiopia and South Sudan. Um, very different stages of the CADEP process. So in Ethiopia, they already have an investment plan. It's already been implemented. Um, they were hoping at the time there was going to be a revision in June, and um, they proposed these recommendations to be included in the revision. But from what I understand, in the end, the decision was made not to revise the plan at this stage. Uh, but however, the, the cadet team in country did say, you know, do go ahead with the, these recommendations in the context of programs anyway, and we will try to include them in the next revision. South Sudan, very different. They hadn't even started working on their cattle investment plan, but this workshop proved a very good opportunity to start thinking about what could go in there, putting on nutrition lands from the beginning. Um, things didn't exactly happen that way in the end, but at the time, that's what we hoped. Um, so uh, briefly, lessons learned. Countries loved learning from each other. Uh, they very much appreciated the opportunity to speak amongst you know, sectors that often do not interact at country level. Um, they liked the practicality of the technical content, the fact that it was very much uh, building on case studies and, and practical advice. Um, it demystified uh, nutrition by agricultural professionals. They're like, ah, you mean I don't need to go take weight and height and I don't need to distribute vitamin supplements? Ah, you mean I have to do aquaculture and, and livestock, but I, I can do that. So it, it was, um, I think an important demystifying exercise. Uh, we found that the process was often easier to run and potentially more effective where sun and reach were already present because there was an ongoing dialogue that was there and we could plug into it and add value to these ongoing dynamics. Um, and although we were focused on nutrition, the process actually was contributing to better agriculture programming in, in general. The challenge is, is that when the countries go back, um, you know, you go back to these parallel coordination mechanisms where agriculture and nutrition are often in different circles. Um, they're conflicting political priorities. Often the priority for agriculture is to improve revenue, is to generate economic growth. Um, and sometimes, especially in the short term, that is not always compatible with nutrition objectives. Um, and there's often a lot of different agendas. Um, the institutional capacities to follow up uh, at country level and regional level are, are still very uh, weak. We have a huge need for technical assistance. And um, 
unfortunately also in terms of the technical assistance we don't have that many people who are so familiar yet with these agriculture nutrition or or maybe a lot of people are but it's been made to, it's been uh, made to seem very complicated um so we really need to strengthen our ability to support countries um many nutritionists don't necessarily know agriculture and vice versa. It's hard to find people who have who, who straddle the two sides. Question is still on how much does it cost? What are the trade-offs? And uh, so really the engagement of all nutrition, and actually uh, I made a typo there, of all nutrition and agriculture partners will actually be key for success. And, and I would say in particular some of the, the donors um, into the support that are that's being provided to the ag investment. In terms of follow-up, so many countries uh, uh, said, you know, they would start by feeding back the results at country level and with some coordination mechanisms, um, that it was a good opportunity for, for the nutrition stakeholders to better understand what are the steps in PADEP and what are the entry points and uh, the mechanisms, what's the time you engage, what's the meeting you should never miss, uh, that kind of thing. And, of course, um, mobilizing resources for implementing the roadmap. We've had a brilliant situation in Sierra Leone where um, just as the team was in the workshop two, um, two years ago, at the same time we in FAO received a confirmation from Germany that they were ready to support a project to provide technical assistance on mainstreaming nutrition in the CADEP there. Uh, so that was ideal because we said, hey, we've got this fund, let's take your roadmap and put it straight in the project document. Um, and now they, they have that technical system and things are, are slowly moving, but that was a rare occasion. These occasions are becoming more common as more uh, donors in particular are putting nutrition on their agenda, but they still need to be uh, harnessed and, and multiplied. At the regional level, we have a lot of opportunities for the African Union Year of Agriculture, the African Day for Teaching and Nutrition. Um, we can also ensure linkages uh, between the sun and the renewed partnership for ending hunger and malnutrition. And we, again, with the support from the German Ministry of Agriculture here in FAO, we, we will uh, be able to continue some very specific technical assistance on nutrition information systems. Actually, that's already su also su supported a bit in the context of an EU FAO program. Uh, but we'd also like to do more on nutrition and extension. Um, so. These are areas where we have resources, but the big gap is at the country level. Here are some websites for uh, where you can get more information. Um, and just the last slide on 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 the way forward in general. Um, I'm current. I'm I'm sometimes worried that you know we have a great momentum on nutrition with the sun and everything, but these kind of things are usually hard to sustain. I mean, at one point. There's a fatigue that starts to settle, and I think we really need to get to use this window of opportunity um, to get stuff going on the ground, which can't be undone. Uh, for example, to have agriculture people get so used to doing some nutrition in their work that they, c they don't stop doing it because it becomes natural. Um, we need to anchor nutrition in some of the agricultural decision-making processes. Uh, for example, at the CFS level, at the global level. Um, and in the countries, uh, in the agriculture planning department, and also in the Ministry of Finance, we need to invest more in technical assistance and capacity development with a long-term perspective, which includes in the agriculture uh, training institutes and uh, universities. Um, increase the mobilization of consumers in the private sector. Agriculture is de facto a private sector. It will respond to consumer demands. And, uh, Consumer associations have a potentially huge role to play, uh, and the private sector as well. So I think we need to engage a little bit more, uh, especially the consumer associations, because they can be a real ally. We only had one representative of a consumer association in Southern Africa. Um, more research on programs and sharing of experiences. We need more work on costs and costing methods. Um, also, more research on policy instruments that can create incentives for improving diets. You know, at the macro level, uh, more and more people are dependent on markets for, for buying and, and accessing food. What are the levers we can use in terms of taxes and subsidies and tariffs, and both from the production side and the consumption side? In, in the SOFA um, that we produced uh, two months ago, we, we did do a bit of a review of, of experiences, and it's, there's no clear-cut answer. One instrument can work in a certain way in one context and another in another, but 
uh, if, if countries can have a little bit more guidance or at least more uh, sharing of the experiences, that could be helpful. Key milestones are the CFS meetings. So next week, we hope to be really pushing the uh, kind of ideas forward. The ICN2, of course, the AU Year of Agriculture, and I'm sure there are more. Uh, for example, the, the global level panel that was established in the G8 Summit on Agriculture and Nutrition um, hopefully can play a role in, in supporting uh, this work. And I think that is my last slide. Yeah. Thanks, Charlotte. That was great. The interesting thing for me recently on some work I've been doing is looking at agriculture and realizing that agriculture and food are now quite divorced in a sense. And I mean, that's coming from, I think, the OECD world because agriculture produces a set of commodities which it trades and a food industry produces food. And most consumers are quite unaware of the you know, they wouldn't recognize uh, what's on their plate if they saw it growing in the field as the raw materials. I think in the developing world, that's still a very different sort of um, thing. And most people do are very familiar with where their food comes from. But I think the bigger picture, the public sector research and everything, is much more like the OECD. It produces on input traits and not on output characteristics. So, you know... I mean, at the minute, I was recently trying to find the percentages of public sector agricultural research that goes to grains versus fruits and vegetables versus livestock versus fish. No one got the data. No one could actually tell me what those percentages are. And I think because of the 70s food crisis and the 2008 crisis, there's always this drive for grains. And I mean, last week we had a debate, uh, I had a debate with Prabhu Pingali who, you know, whose argument is if you produce more grains, more grains, more grains, and lower the price of grains, then people will use that income to buy more nutritious products. But that's a research question, whether you reduce that price sufficiently that it offsets the increase in prices of the higher nutrient foods. But nobody's done the research on that either. So, I mean, for me, it's sort of, it's how we're going to marry up this sort of OECD sort of uh, divorce of agriculture and food and actually remarry them, if you like, in the developing world and make people aware that they're much, they're much closer there than they are in our world, if you like. It's something uh, that we've been discussing with the um, Fund Secretariat, actually, trying to see how we can better link um, these two exercises. Uh, for the moment, uh, we haven't been able to really address that question properly, partly due to uh, overwork and, and lack of, of resources to focus on it, but we're putting it in our planning for the coming year. Um, but beyond that <laughs> very silly uh, excuse, I think that some of the challenges are that until recently and for the moment, um, there is actually very little in the agricultural investment plans related to nutrition. You know, I mean, the World Bank, for example, does public expenditure reviews on agriculture, um, on sort of tracking the expenditures and the impacts and what they anticipate them to be. But, I mean, as yet, those are not nutritionized, for want of a better word. So I guess also within our donor processes, um, when we're looking at the expenditure type reviews, how do we incorporate it within that? And we're seeing, you know, the, the recommendations that are coming up in these workshops a, they're fresh. I'm really curious to learn uh, how we can actually integrate it in this national costing plans uh, which are being uh, done uh, within the Sun initiative. How we can link this, or is there already examples where where the uh, this agricultural nutrition uh, costing plan are linked with the Sun initiative? It's quite a process to get them into the plans and and. If you think, uh, for example, in Tanzania, where we had the workshop in um, February, um, we were really hoping to have uh, this, uh, this recommendation taken on board in the Agricultural Sector Development Plan too, which is being formulated, but that formulation process is taking longer. So because of the, the pace of some of these policy-making processes, it's difficult for us to start really getting to some of the, of the nitty-gritty questions. That said, actually, and it's a shame one of my colleagues come here in Bangladesh, they've been doing a lot of detailed work on that and, and we'd like to learn. So there's that first challenge is, okay, 
we need to be costing in the context of the plan that actually has to be has to be put nutrition. And on the side of the multi-sectoral nutrition plan, they've really struggled to know what to put in agriculture. So if, um, I, there was one country I won't name. Uh, they had a $500 million nutrition plan when they costed their plan. But agriculture reacted because they're like, hey, wait a minute, there's only three or four million for agriculture in this, or very little. Um, and if you looked at the plan, actually 60% of it was, was products for the treatment and, and management of malnutrition um, so through the health system. But then when agriculture was asked, okay, so what do you want to put in? They said, okay, we'll put in cold storage uh, facilities. And well, the nutrition people said, well, uh, not really. So it, we, that it's definitely work to be done, um, but it, it has to go hand in hand with clarifying exactly what it is that, that, that we cost. And, and kind of going on to what Lynn was saying, um, I, I think a, a difficulty we have in tracking um, the nutrition part, so to speak, is for us, at least my, my, my personal approach to this is, it's not necessarily putting in more money or less money or whatever. It, it's more about how are you going to target a certain intervention? How, what's the balance? If you're going to have $100 million to invest, uh, how much of, your, of that are you going to invest in your maize production uh, and input systems? on how much uh, towards other forms of, of agriculture. So that's where the costing issue is, is a bit delicate because it's um, not necessarily more cost, but just a different strategy for using that money on one hand. And a big question is also the trade-off. So I'm not going to produce so much maize, although that I'm guaranteed to have ex so much revenue or so much income or employment. I'm going to choose to diversify with investments um, that are linked towards diversification, but that entails a slightly different risk. I have much less clarity on the market, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I'm not probably answering your questions very well, but just to say, you know, it's, um, it's something that is a, it's complex, but that really needs to be addressed. A positive thing for us nutritionists is that until recently, nutrition was not considered very important by more noble sciences like economy. But now our agronomists are starting to take these issues of nutrition much more seriously, and, and we're going to need the, the expertise um, to, to help us resolve some of these issues. And, and, and about the issues on commodities and food, I think thanks a lot, then for, for that distinction, because uh, it's... Um, I think this ag nutrition agenda is really one about breaking, bringing down barriers. Uh, so we also have sometimes that distinction between food and nutrition. Um, so nutrition is the supplement and food is food and that's not nutrition. And, and I hadn't picked up on that one, commodities in different from food. Um, the, more and more people are talking about food systems or agriculture and food systems. And, and I think that's the entry point we can use to start breaking down that artificial barrier. Um, not only because it's true that in developing countries, um, they are still much more merged, but also because we're, we're probably not going to be able to find sustainable solutions if we, in all contexts. And even in developing countries, I mean, the, the, the role of supermarkets uh, and, and processed foods is, is probably going to grow exponentially together with urbanization. So we don't want the kind of mechanisms and, and thinking processes that have been taking place in, in our quote-unquote developed economies to, to be business as usual um, in, in those uh, countries. Um, I, I'm hoping that's where an, one thing that we advocate for as well in FAO is bringing together uh, on the nutrition agenda and the environment agenda. Because if we look at the changes in diet and um, nutritional problems, they often have their parallel in changes in the environment in terms of the loss of biodiversity, the degradation of natural resources, the simplification of a farming system not only leads to a potential simplification of, of the diet in, in some circumstances, it's also increasing, it's, it's exposing that system to, to environmental risk. Um, so I, I, that's, that's also what makes this agenda a bit challenging, is because it's really challenging us to think in a systemic way and breaking down barriers that we've been used to working with. 
Um, and it's probably why the focus should be on country level action because um, and learning from experiences and sharing across countries because often when you look at a situation on the ground, you do see the linkages be between them. And, and that's also where I think the consumer associations have a very big role to play um, uh, in that, especially in contexts where people are more and more aware of both the health side and, and the nutrient side. We see in Europe, you know, the consumers demand for healthy foods, organic, environmentally friendly, et cetera, is starting to force the industry to, to work in a certain way. Um, I wanted to say one last thing that we also need to bear in mind as an important area of work because it's a big driver of consumer behavior is the convenience of food. Um, so the drivers for consumption are, you know, price, um, but also convenience of food. So if we can look at affordable uh, and nutritious uh, processed foods, that could, um, I think, be an important lever. I think that, you know, uh, to put more nutrition in agriculture is also a matter of a hard choice. I think we have to go more at the food level and make a hard choice. It's very correct that it should be done at national level. So the present initiative, absolutely, they're useful. But I think that, you know, as we've been discussing several other occasions, there are two dimensions tackled together. Number one, the strategic one. Uh, nutrition is uh, not only uh, a sector, sector it's a dimension who gives us the possibility to analyze at the same time it will identify key factors uh, in development or underdeveloped. That's why it is so, so precious. The other, at the other hand, we need to be very operational and have a very clear chain of command in the different sectors. So I think it's very nice to have a broader uh, uh, a broader framework, but at the end of the day, we have to go in the different uh, system, farming system of different country and make this choice. And I think this is what is difficult. And I don't know how much we are ready. Science is there. Um, the policy analysis is there, but I think it's a long way. And I want to conclude say that the warning of Charlotte is very appropriate. Um, now is a good moment, like was in the 80s for nutrition. But we should not lose this opportunity. This means, again, also to go more in the field. And at the same time, to acknowledge that there is a pendulum, uh, you know, shifted from agriculture to health uh, and living in the middle of the social dimension. So, uh, you know, when we speak about health, we generally have a more concern for the consumer and for agriculture, more for the producer. And as I say, often forget in the social dimension. I think the, the, the other uh, uh, challenge besides going more to the field and make our choice is trying to put together the three elements, which is proper of nutrition. It is a strength of nutrition. It was a very excellent presentation, and uh, I just would like to ask you uh, about the role of the private sector, which is and which was so far the level of the engagement of the private sector within the revisions of the of the regional plans within the CADAP the CADAP framework, and also I will be quite curious about the presence if there the, there was any presence of uh, some. Uh, Industry, food industry, or some some representative from the private sector to this workshop. Thank you. In terms of the role of the private sector in these plans, uh, that I think it depends on on the countries. But usually, the process of preparing the CADEP investment plan is done through a very consultative process where uh, different representatives of the private sector, especially uh, the farmer organizations or producer organizations should, in theory, be present. Now, then, of course, it depends a bit on, on the context. Um, for our workshop, uh, we, we really encourage countries to invite private sector representatives. We have a list of selection criteria and, 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 and encourage that. Of course, then, we were not the final decision makers on that. So we didn't have as many as we hoped, but in each workshop, we had maybe three to five or six representatives, sometimes of a farmer organization. And last in Botswana, we had somebody from a local food processing industry 
so that was more the, the engagement we had. Um, we did not necessarily have the multinationals uh, directly involved, um, not that it was a deliberate uh, action. We were, we were held back, you know, at a practical level by the number of participants we could accommodate and the fact that countries prioritized government stakeholders. But I think we're going to need to be engaging uh, them more, but uh, with a, a clear understanding of what private sector is, and in particular for the nutrition agenda and the food security agenda, I think really having the local producer organization, the local processing institutions and organizations as um, a key key stakeholders, because we I think building the capacity of the local private sector um, will be absolutely fundamental to um, the livelihoods, the income generation uh, in those countries. And so both from the supplies, we can, we can um, build up that private sector so that it's contributing to more employment, more income, et cetera, therefore enabling families to buy better food. Uh, but we can also try to work with them, encouraging them to produce um, more, more diverse foods. We had a very interesting case study in Tanzania um, of uh, this initiative in Kenya where some a local NGO promoted the production of uh, uh, indigenous foods and the marketing, and now this is being picked up uh, as as a small business. So that's uh, but from from the multinational side, not so much. What I find interesting um, in general on this issue is when we're talking to the big guys, the Nestle's, the Unilever's, etc. You talk nutrition, and very much you know they're going to send you the nutritionist who's going to tell you about the fortified products and uh, this or that, and we're like, well. We want to talk to your guy, your colleagues who are working with the private, with the um, with the producer organization. What can you guys do? It's not just about nutrition in the in the multinational. Should not be about adding supplements or or processing in a certain way. It can also be looking at the whole chain. Um, I, I would really advocate, though, that as we engage the private sector, we engage the consumer association and. Um, I think that strengthening the capacity of local consumer associations could be a very, very important uh, strategy because ultimately, and that kind of links back to what Mara was saying about the pendulum swinging and, and things like that, I think the real change will come when governments, private sector, et cetera, have a genuine incentive to make more nutritious, healthy, safe foods, et cetera, available. It's in their economic interest. Um, how do we do that? The consumer demand, largely, um, and sometimes with some regulation. And I think if that, uh, unless these incentives are there, the whole topic will indeed be subject to, is this the fad of the moment? If this is the donor darling of the day? Uh, and uh, I'm hoping that, you know, with the ICN2, I'm hoping the ICN2 will be the beginning of something and not the end of something as it seems the last ICN was. You know, everybody geared up to it and then boom. So, um, and, and I, on, in addition to this issue of creating incentives, I'm, I'm hoping that the other fads of the moment, the resilience agenda, the social protection, are not going to just die down and disappear as well because they are absolutely fundamental to what you were saying now about this link, you know, the, the social side. So as nutrition, I would, I would, you know, we, for our nutrition champions, we can be opportunistic and really ride the nutrition agriculture course, so to speak, but also be very much engaged in the uh, area of social protection, be very much engaged in the area of resilience, um, as well as on the environment, because A, good nutrition is fundamental to all of those, and vice versa, each of those is fundamental to sustainably improving nutrition. Yeah, hi Charlotte. I just wanted to, well first let me just introduce myself. My name is Nigel Nicholson. I work for the uh, Nutrition Advisory Service to the European Commission. And uh, recently uh, this service has been providing technical support to EU delegations, particularly in Zimbabwe, Zambia, Mozambique. And Charlotte, I'm just wondering from the, um, the recent uh, workshop that you had in Haberoni, 
whether the issue, whether you know, in particular, a common issue across the region was discussed about the the high prevalence of chronic undernutrition, particularly in the high agricultural producing areas, and um, you know whether this is something which was uh, openly discussed across countries, and whether there might be. Um, you know, commonalities that could be drawn across, drawn upon, uh, particularly in strategies to to deal with this. And I think a lot of this has come out of the, um, the very sort of aggressive promotion of maize production over the past few years that must be affecting quite a number of countries in that region. Thanks. Thanks a lot. That's a great point. The issue uh, of that paradox of having high funding, especially in the food production areas, uh, we, we did raise, did come up, at least in the plenaries. Um, I can't say it was a, an area of specific focus just because of the sheer breadth of what we were covering. I'm, I'm sure, I don't know, I don't, I, we had so many participants, so many discussions happening at the same time, both within countries and across, that I can't tell you whether that was discussed at length or how. Um, I know that in countries like Malawi, where that is a big issue, um, it was great to have the director of planning saying we can't just be working on maize. Um, but I can't, I'm not sure how deep the, the prise de conscience, you know, the, the awareness of that uh, paradox has been into. I, I see, I feel that these workshops um, were really about opening the door in many cases for, for some of the, both agriculture and nutrition people. Um, and now would actually also be a good, once, now that this door is open, it's going to be very important to populate it with both, um, you know, potentially research or sharing experiences and, and, and discussions about issues like the one you've brought up, um, but, al but also uh, more action. And actually, it's really, you know, the EU um, communication and these EU programs in the region are going to be a massive opportunity to put some of this in practice. Uh, if I take Zambia, um, so we left Botswana the Friday night. By Monday evening, we had an email from our colleague in Zambia saying, we've debriefed with uh, the Agriculture uh, Development Partners Group. Everybody's really motivated. The ministry is really motivated. The EU. Uh, program that is there. We could, we're trying to see if we can accommodate some of, of these uh, recommendations and that. Um, but there is a lot of learning yet to be done, and there are massive capacity constraints to be addressed. I think another core message, going back to what Lynn was saying at the very beginning, is that we need to demonstrate success, but I would also urge ourselves to not underestimate the task at hand and say from the outstart, it will take time. It's a very complex issue. Um, without dramatizing it and making it too scary, finding the balance between demystifying it saying your grandmother knew about this all along, food and nutrition is obvious, blah, blah. but at the same time recognizing that if we want to do this correctly, we are actually going to be raising very tough questions about the way our food systems work, recognizing that we have a lot of learning to do, that we have huge capacity gaps, and I would really hope we're not going to put ourselves in a situation to fail. Um, so we need to recognize that. I, I've worked before being in headquarters in Afghanistan for about um, well, four years in the Ministry of Agriculture, but overall in a period of 10 years, and I still follow it today, I can tell you it is not a straightforward road. Um, it, you know, policy processes, programs, priorities, agendas change all the time. Capacity takes a while to build. Afghanistan is very positive. Um, we started 10 years ago. There was nobody in the Ministry of Agriculture who knew about nutrition. There were four women who didn't come to work. They had nothing to do. Today, they, they have uh, staff in 30 provinces. They've got $2 million of budget. This is in agriculture, and the minister is taking it seriously. And yet, there is still so much to be done for it to really have an impact on the ground. So, uh, yeah, we, we should be positive, demystify, but really not underestimate the, the task at hand. Okay, thanks, Charlotte. I think this was a really interesting presentation and give us lots to think about. I'd like to say thank you to the newcomers, and I hope that you will also come back to our group to continue these discussions on nutrition. I mean, to Nigel, I'd particularly say 
I think it's very interesting when you say maize production goes up, but actually nutrition either stagnates or gets worse, because for me, I'm going to say aflatoxins. Um, mm. People know that's my favorite topic, and uh, I'm launching a campaign, so you know, if you're interested, talk to me. I don't want to take any time, but just to, to support what has been said before, uh, the, the case of um, high malnutrition and high food use in agricultural area, I would say, is the classic and shows the strength of um, nutrition, as the dimension, and so as not only agricultural tool but the development tool. So I, I fully agree with what Charlotte say, especially the fact that it will be a long process. And again, I think the closer we are in the field and we are able to, to make choice and then to transform in line of command. Uh, they have to be transformed in services by the private or the public sector. And I think especially in the Mediterranean area, Africa, I would say in the majority of the, of the planet, there is no division between food security and nutrition. What we speak about, the quality of food, is in the culture of many of us. So I'm more optimistic, not only from the consumer side, but also from the producer side, which should not be neglected. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, everybody, and it's Friday afternoon in Europe, where most of you are. I'm obviously only just starting my day. So have a great weekend, all, and enjoy your Friday happy hours. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot.